So during this presentation, I thought it was really important to kind of dive into the why. And I can imagine that on this presentation, we have individuals with a wide range of understanding about when it comes to um, nutrition, some that have maybe studied it for a really long time and some who are maybe brand new to it. Regardless of where somebody is, you know, I do want to make sure that I'm honing in on where that individual is. But even some of my clients and patients who are incredibly knowledgeable about nutrition, I mean, I've worked with registered nurses and health coaches and dietitian spouses and everything like that, the why it becomes so more important and so much more motivational if we can understand that. So that's where we're going to start here. Um, and one of the biggest things that I want to present here is um, it's called the third expert report, and it comes from the World Cancer Research Fund and the American Institute for Cancer Research. And every 10 years, they put out a report that reviews the research available on diet, nutrition, physical activity, and cancer. And it really is a global perspective. Um, so there are a couple of things in the report that some people maybe in the United States, for example, might be like, what, what is this talking about? Um, because it doesn't tend to be an issue here in the U.S. Um, and so their role here in terms of this expert report is to use comprehensive analysis and the most meticulous methods and the worldwide body of evidence on preventing and surviving cancer through diet, nutrition, physical activity, and pre present them as the cancer recommendations. Um, so this is, um, it's actually a 12,000 page um, report. Uh, you can also get like a hundred page summary if you're interested, or you can review the 10 main recommendations. Um, so if you are ever looking for uh, lots of reading to do, um, get the full third expert report. Um, I actually have the original, the first one that came out. Um, so there is lots and lots of research in here, lots of graphs. Um, if nutrition research bores you, then you can have this be nighttime reading before bed. Uh, but that's where some of this information comes from is from the third expert report. Now I'm kind of curious um, if anybody, so for those of you, if you would mind engaging with me here um, through Mentimeter, um, how familiar are you with the third expert report on diet, nutrition, and physical activity? Um, whether you know it well, or you never heard of it or its findings. Um, and now I can't remember what my third option was there. Um, but right now, uh, most all the people that are engaging are saying that they've never heard of it or its findings um, and recommendations. And I think that just goes to show how much more education that we need because these are available, but you're probably not hearing about it at cancer centers or through your physicians or whatever it might be. Um, and there's lots of detailed information through here, and we're going to review some of it today and going to make sure that you understand the why in a little bit deeper way. All right. Thank you for those who are able to engage with us here. All right. So this is an image that comes from the third expert report, and I am a big believer in, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a visual learner, so I kind of like to see some of these things. Now, depending on how big your screen is, some of these words might be a little bit small for you to read. But again, you'll get all the PDF slides at the end. Um, I can show you how to get those. But this is an example of what the cancer process looks like. Obviously, incredibly simplified, um, but all the factors that can play a role in the development of cancer. So we start with, consider the top on the top left here, just like a normal cell. And then that cell starts to change and have a little bit of damage and that's considered precancerous. And then um, that ch cell changes quite a bit and becomes invasive cancer. Obviously, that's the very simplified process. But if we look below that orange arrow that says cancer process, we have these big factors that play a role into that process. Some of them are the host factors or you as an individual, such as your genetics, right? Whether you have an increased risk through a certain mutation or not, um, your microbiome, your gut microbiome and that bacteria that lives within us, not just only in our gut, but also on our skin, that can play a role in cancer development or cancer protection. Um, obviously, a, a presentation on the gut microbiome and how it plays a role in cancer would be an entirely different presentation, but an incredible one too. Um, your age, as we increase in age, our risk of cancer goes up. Um, our gender, um, it's obvious, um, you know, that plays a role. Women actually are more um, inclined, obviously, to have certain cancers than, uh, than males and vice versa. Your metabolic state and really um, metabolism. Metabolism actually plays a really big role in cancer development and whether there's something called insulin resistance 
occurring or not, which I believe um, some of the other presenters in this um, series are going to be talking about insulin resistance. So that's something that's really important can play a role in cancer development, um, inflammation and other factors. Now, environmental factors, right? Some of these are within our control. Some of them are not, um, but viruses, radiation, environmental carcinogens, et cetera. And then of course, diet and lifestyle factors, which I'm more focused on. Um, this is where a big chunk of those um, controllables are. Um, I do believe that some of the host factors are controllable as well, such as the microbiome. You have some control over that and also the metabolic state, um, but also the nutrients, our energy intake, phytochemicals, which we'll talk a little bit about, alcohol, physical activity, et cetera. Um, now, I kind of talked a little bit about the metabolic state, but here, um, this is a direct quote from the third expert report that says the interaction between the host metabolic state and dietary or nutrition and physical activity and other environmental exposures over the whole life course is critical to protection from or susceptibility to cancer development. So these are things that when it comes to nutrition, we really want to be focusing on is our individual metabolic state and our physical activity and nutrition, et cetera. Um, now, this is my simplified version of what cancer development looks like. And the reason I want to show you this, because it's really going to play a role in um, some of the nutri nutrients that we talk about moving forward. So on the left-hand side, consider that this is a normal cell. Now, within all of our cells, we have a, our DNA. Our DNA makes us uniquely who we are, right? And, um, you know, small random fact, I actually have a twin sister. Um, we don't know if we're identical or not. My parents didn't know they were having twins until an hour before we were born. Um, so they didn't really care if we were identical or not at that moment. And we've actually never really found out. But let's just assume that we're identical because we probably are. Her and I share the exact same DNA then, for example. But her and I are actually, although we have similar lifestyles, similar diets, we're similar personalities, I developed cancer at this age and she didn't, right? So there, obviously there's a, an example of how there are other factors at, at play here. Um, but within that cell, we have that DNA. So a lot of cancer development has a lot to do with DNA damage. And that's why I want to explain this to you, because if you can understand DNA damage, it can really help us play a role in nutrition. Okay, so DNA damage happens to our DNA our entire life. Every single day, we are constantly having damage to our DNA through various things, right? Chemicals, the food we eat, physical inactivity, sun damage, aging, etc. There are a lot of things that can damage our DNA. So our goal as individuals should be to try to implement strategies, nutrients, physical activity that can help protect our DNA from this damage as much as possible and possibly even repair damage that has happened. Because if there's initial DNA damage, sometimes um, that will lead to further genetic damage. And what happens is when we have one cell, um, depending on how long it's been since you had biology class, but one cell replicates and divides into two cells. Two cells become four cells, four cells become eight cells and so on. So with that normal cell, has some DNA damage to it and becomes no longer normal, but then it's going to replicate and divide, replicate and divide. Then you have all of these cells that let's talk about in this case are, can are developing cancerous cells and they're just growing and growing and growing. Cancer is uncontrolled cell growth. Okay. So then we move on and we have an initiated cell. There's genetic damage that's still happening. For some reason, the body isn't repairing against that damage. And then unfortunately it can progress into the cancer progression and a malignant tumor or cancer causing tumor. Okay. So I want you, what I really want you to take away from this slide here is DNA damage and how we want to try to reduce DNA damage as much as possible and employ ways that actually can help repair DNA if it has been damaged. So how are we going to do that with nutrition? Well, first and foremost, remember, I talked about the importance of why I really want you to understand this why. So I do think there are some terms that um, might be important for you to understand, like even if you're far from the medical field, one of those is apoptosis. Apoptosis is defined as programmed cell death 
And this does occur normally in our body. In fact, we actually want it to occur normally and in a healthy manner, because essentially the way that I like to describe it is it's about it's um, apoptosis is your body saying, Hey, this is a bad cell. We need to get rid of it before it can be continue to grow. Right. So let's say it's that normal cell that becomes damaged apoptosis. And then remember, I'm simplifying a lot of this, but um, still follow along with me is that apoptosis will say, Hey, this cell has damage. Let's get rid of it before it can continue to replicate and divide. So we want this apoptosis to happen. If apoptosis is reduced and not happening appropriately, it can lead to many types of cancer or even other types of disease as well. Another, um, term that I want you to understand is called genome instability. And this is caused by defects in the process that control how cells divide. So think of that as essentially like genetics, for example, many of the mutations that some people carry or that have been identified that increase the risk of cancer play a role in and have a defect in the process of how we repair DNA or how it divides, et cetera. So the biggest takeaway from this is that I want you to understand that genome instability is not a good thing. Also inflammation, many people are really familiar with inflammation, but maybe don't quite understand about why it's so um, detrimental to our health, um, but it can be a critical component of tumor progression. And then also something called a macrophage. I promise why I'm demonstrating these um, definitions will make a lot more sense very soon. Um, so a macrophage is a type of cell in the body capable of engulfing and destroying harmful invaders or cells. Again, I want you to think of this as this type of cell that says, hey, this is a bad cell, let's get rid of it, um, and um, really make sure that cell can't progress. Now, if these things aren't happening appropriately in our body, then it can lead to cancer, can lead to other diseases, et cetera. Um, I also I should have mentioned macrophage function is altered. Cancer cells may avoid destruction. So again, if it doesn't engulf that bad cell, that bad cell is going to replicate and divide, replicate and divide. That's all cancer cells want to do. Let's just grow as big as possible, as quickly as possible. Now, back to this slide again, just to show you that um, those things that I just mentioned in terms of the apoptosis, macrophage, really all impact a lot of this here, um, where if it doesn't detect the damaged cell, it can lead to this malignant tumor. Now, a few important notes as we dive into nutrition a little bit further is that it's um, this comes from the third expert report is that it's unlikely that specific foods, nutrients, or other components of foods themselves are important singular factors in causing or protecting cancer. And why I think this is really important to share with you is because it's not necessarily just one nutrient that is going to protect us completely from cancer, not just one food that is going to protect us from cancer. Now, it is true that we have identified some nutrients that play a bigger role in helping to reduce the risk of cancer, but it's in the long run, it can't just be like, oh, I eat this one food every day and therefore I'm never going to get cancer or disease. No, it really has to do with what the diet and the lifestyle looks like as a whole picture. Um, and same goes on the opposite end. We do know that there are some foods that can drastically increase um, one's risk of cancer, but eating that food just one time likely is not going to develop cancer. It's the repeated intake of that or what the rest of the diet looks like that really makes a difference. Now, this is, a, this is another um, quote from it that really is talking about patterns of diet and physical activity. Instead of reading this kind of complicated um, quote, I want to share with you that really, more simply put, it's the overall dietary and lifestyle pattern that matters most. Okay, it can be really easy, especially us as cancer patients, to get really caught up in like one specific food or one specific meal where maybe you didn't get it perfect, right? But I also want my patients to understand that the mental stress that it carries about trying to always get it perfect isn't good for our, um, for cancer either. So um, I really try to encourage my patients to focus on the overall dietary lifestyle and pattern. What you do one time isn't going to necessarily make a difference. It's what you do most of the time that really makes the biggest difference and impact. Um, and also studies have shown that the more people adhere to the cancer re prevention recommendations, which we'll just, we're going to touch on here next, is that the greater reductions in the risk of specific cancers um, as a whole and of death of any other cause, right? So 
the great, what I love about my job is that the things that I'm teaching to my patients that have been impacted by cancer is that they're actually helping to reduce their heart disease risk, um, lowering blood pressure, lowering cholesterol levels, reducing their diabetes risk. Um, and that's, what's so great about it is that, um, you know, the right approach with dietary and lifestyle can reduce the risk of many different types of disease, not just cancer in this case. Now, uh, this um, page I know is very small for you to probably be able to read. This comes from the third expert report, um, but in the next few slides, I'm actually breaking them down so you can see them a little bit further. Um, but what this is, is this is essentially a very good summary of some of the recommendations that come from the third expert report and how different parts are going to potentially impact the body. So for example, greater body fatness, how it can impact our body as a whole and how it can play a role in potential cancer development. So we're gonna go through each of these here. So this first one right here um, is the, the exposure of greater body fatness. Um, the greater body fatness, unfortunately, research has shown that it can increase our insulin or cause higher amounts of insulin, um, also increase our estrogen, which um, is crucially important for um, breast cancer survivors that had hormonally positive cancers, and then also increase our inflammation. Now, if we go skip over the cell function, that starts, you know, you can really nerd out on that stuff if you guys would like, um, but we're going to jump over to the hallmarks possibly affected. So remember when I talked about those terms and how I thought it was really crucially for, important for you to understand, this is where the connection really happens, right? So if we have high amounts of insulin, you might say, well, what's wrong with that, right? We do need insulin in our bodies, correct? But high, um, high amounts of insulin over long per periods of time can reduce apoptosis, right? We talked about how we want apoptos apoptosis to happen appropriately. It can increase proliferation, which is essentially the growth of those cancer cells, increase genome instability, and increase our altered macrophase function. Okay. So can you see how understanding the why of like, oh, okay, if I'm at a higher weight, it may mean that I have higher insulin levels, potentially higher estrogen levels, potentially higher inflammation, and it may increase my risk of cancer in these ways. Okay. Now it is, I also want to make it clear that just because someone has is overweight, um, it does not necessarily mean that they do have all these things, but I think it would be really important for us to screen that in our health. How are our estrogen levels? What are our, what's our fasting state, insulin, et cetera, um, and, and so forth. Now, furthermore, we know that lower fruit and vegetable intake, this goes back to that patient saying, well, I don't want you to tell me about fruit and vegetables, right? Yes, but if I can tell you why, if I can show you that research shows that if we have a folate deficiency because we don't eat enough fruits and vegetables, it can cause genome instability, right? We just talked about how genome instability increases our risk for cancer. Our low dietary fiber intake, if we have low fiber intake, then we often have low butyrate, which is a short chain fatty acid. But why does that matter to us for cancer? Well, it can reduce apoptosis and increase proliferation. It can also have low levels of carotenoids, vitamins A, C, and E, which can lead to increased inflammation, genome instability, reduced apoptosis, and increased proliferation. Mm -hmm.